Jared Solomon, I'm a state representative in Northeast Philadelphia, co-chair of the America 250PA Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee. Let me tell you why I think this is important and then we're gonna go around the horn and introduce everybody and everyone will make some opening remarks. So if you look at the previous celebrations of America, the most successful one is probably the centennial. Um, and then sort of some successes, some uh, near successes, some, some epic failures. But the centennial was wildly successful. And why was it successful? Because we here in Pennsylvania were able to bring the nation and the world to our state in an, and in an effort to demonstrate to the rest of the world and the country our prowess in kind of every sector of society, new technological developments, our military prowess, new agricultural developments, the business community and what the business community was going to be moving towards in the next 10, 20, 30 years, the tourism sector. That's why we were able to have a celebration that everybody was able to go back in that centennial and say, I was in Pennsylvania and I uh, was able to be part of history. We want to do that again. We want to do that again in 2026. And the only way we will do that is taking sort of that mantle that the centennial gave us of being able to celebrate our past, grapple with our present, and figure out what the next steps are for our future here in Pennsylvania. We have the model and we hope as we go through these tours to be able to identify the projects that are going to celebrate the past, um, embrace our present, and chart a new course for our future. So that's what we're here to do. And I want to introduce everybody uh, here. So let me, for this is your district, Anita. Anita, why don't you welcome us to your district and, uh, and uh, introduce yourself. So I am Anita Kulik. I was born and raised here in Carnegie. I'm extremely proud that we were able to have this meeting and thank you so much when I suggested having the meeting here that it was most welcome. Um, what we're trying to do with the Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee, what we're trying to accomplish in Pennsylvania has been accomplished in this town already and in this building. This building was renovated and ha uh, still some ways to go. And I will, can't wait to show everybody this when we are done. But when they started thinking about renovating the building, when we were only using the library portion, the library committee came together. The local government came in and said, we will support this. Get the residents on board and we will support this. And they went door to door to the residents and said, do you support this building? Do you support this historic library? And that's what made this wonderful room happen. If you have not seen the rest of the building, please see it. But this is what we're trying to accomplish. It really is just a little microcosm of what we're trying to do with this committee. So thank you for coming to Carnegie. And it is Carnegie. No, I didn't say anything. I know. I but so many people mispronounce Carnegie, but it is Carnegie. Well, don't look at me. I'm not. Don't look at me. Uh, thank you. That's a great message. Um, and I, I really appreciate that, Representative. Um, Representative Valgatos, why don't you say hello to folks and tell us why this uh, committee is important to you. Thank you so much. Senator Fontana. Thank you. Good to be here, everyone. Again, uh, as Anita alluded to, this, is, uh, this building in itself is very historic. Uh, it should be part of uh, the tourism of Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm the chair of the Sports and Exhibition Authority here in Pittsburgh and certainly um, would love to see uh, some big, nice big projects finished, but also this project finished and uh, put it on display in the future. Um, as been mentioned, we should always remember where we came from. I think it's important to do that. 
this building does that. It, re it brings all those memories back in history back of, of where we were and, we're and actually where we're going in the future. So I think it's important that we do that and it's important that we're here in Pittsburgh and at, in Carnegie and at the Carnegie Carnegie. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot more to do, but I really, really am excited about uh, this, this project, uh, the America 250 PA. We will bring some spotlights here in Pittsburgh I, before it's all done, and certainly to our, our great state. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Dory Lang from Senator Costa's office. Hi, thank you for welcoming us to this beautiful building. I am just honored to be here to represent Senator Costa, and I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dory. Cassandra Col Coleman, America 250 PA. Thanks, Representative. Um, welcome. I am proud to serve as the Executive Director of America 250 PA, a position I've held since the legislation was passed uh, back in 2018. I'm really, really excited to be continuing to build programming and projects to reach every Pennsylvanian in every county across all 67. So there are over a dozen programs and projects currently ongoing. I encourage you to go to our website at America250PA.org to learn more. Um, we are here today, as has been alluded to, for the America 250 PA Infrastructure Improvements and Projects Committee. So I will talk a little bit about what the process will be, and then we will start and dive into the hearing and the testifiers. So each testimony will last five minutes. At about 30 seconds remaining, you'll hear one ding or clang. <laughs> Clunk. Um, our bell was left at home, so we had to improvise. Um, <laughs> at a, Yes, we tried, um, but we're using yeah. the phone also for the timing. So um, when you are finished, we ask you to finish up your thought. You'll hear two clangs. Um, and again, we would ask you to finish your thought. Um, when you are at the table, we do ask that you please turn the microphone on. Feel free to adjust it however you need. Um, if the microphone button is not on, the live stream cannot hear you. So just please remember that. Um, but with that, I think we could get started. So Representative Solomon. Thank you so much. Um, Fred, can we have you come up from uh, Friends of Saxonburg Museum? And please proceed with your testimony. Thanks so much, Fred. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Borough of Saxonburg and the Friends of Saxonburg Museum. While the central focus of the testimony is on the need to undertake major work to preserve the historic John Roebling Wire Rope Workshop in Saxonburg, we believe this infrastructure project meets the expectations of this committee to use history to inspire and celebrate con contributions to Commonwealth's history and our nation's history. Specifically, in order to have a better life like thousands fleeing a chaotic Europe, there is the history of the immigration of John Roebling to America from Mühlhausen, Prussia, now Germany, in 1831, and the founding and building of a town in the woods of Butler County. And then the innovation of perfecting wire rope cable that led to the design and building of suspension bridges once unimaginable. The wire rope workshop dates back to 1838. Roebling used it as an office with areas to do his bridge design work and to develop wire rope cable techniques. In 1842, it is where he received his first U.S. patent. There can be no question the workshop is the birthplace of the wire rope cable industry in America and the workshop's significance goes beyond Roebling's use. Historians describe the building as significant because, it, because it's based on a German settler's house. There are not many of these types of structures remaining. I add, though, that the two-room building was never used by Roebling as a house. Roebling used the approximately 1,200-square-foot workshop until 1849 when he left Saxonburg to relocate his wire rope manufacturing to New Jersey. After his departure, the workshop was sold to local residents. By the 1960s, the building had fallen into disrepair. In 1968, the workshop and surrounding land was donated to the borough of Saxonburg. In 1969, borough council considered demolishing the building, but that did not happen. The borough and community groups worked to preserve the building. They moved the workshop in 1974-75 to its current location. After the move, the Commonwealth nominated the workshop to be placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Approval came November 13, 1976. Thus, 2026 will mark 50 years. In 2001, a local group donated a replica of Roebling's famous Brooklyn Bridge. 
The replica was attached to the north side of the workshop per federal government policies that should have never happened. Sadly, when the workshop was moved to its current location, the stone foundation was not constructed for the long haul, especially in an area where stormwater flow and erosion is a problem. The foundation was de has deteriorated. Our written testimony documents this with photos. There are no longer stone foundations on the side. The building is tilting at least two to four degrees. The floor joists are weakening and the floor is tilting. And where the rep bridge replica is attached, the bolts have popped and a gap has appeared as the building tilts away from the bridge replica. This leads to the scope of the project, to preserve the 185-year-old workshop building for future generations. This means permanently detaching the workshop from the bridge replica while constructing a sturdy foundation with improved drainage solutions. In 2022, the borough of Saxonburg sought bids from engineering firms. Saxonburg's Etzel Engineer and Build submitted a detailed plan to build a new foundation and mitigate water erosion issues. This includes raising the building while a new concrete foundation and pad is constructed. The estimated costs range from $234,000 to $254,000. The Borough of Saxonburg Council is on record that no taxpayer money will be spent on this project, but will greenlight construction once the Friends of Saxonburg Museum raises the necessary funds through donations and state and federal grants. In conclusion, our hope is that the historical significance of the Roebling legacy and being the birthplace of the wire rope industry in America prompts funding from private and government sectors. We believe the workshop preservation is part of celebrating America 250 PA. The historical significance extends beyond Saxonburg, contributing to the history of Butler County, the Commonwealth, and America. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, questions? Anybody? No. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you so much for the testimony. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you. Next up, Elizabeth from the Frick Art and Historical Center. Please come up. Can you hear me? Am I loud enough? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the invitation. The Frick Art and Historical Center respectfully seeks a $1 million America 250 PA infrastructure improvements and projects grant to support a three-year, $6.5 million project to preserve, enhance, and amplify the experience of Clayton, the 23-room historic house of Henry Clay Frick, that provides a unique immersive experience into the key events and issues facing this region and the nation in the 1890s and their impact on our lives today. The Frick will use this support to restore, repaint, and illuminate the exterior of Clayton and redesign the surrounding garden entrance for safety and environmental needs. The repairs and repainting will be completed in 2025, the lighting and landscaping in 2026. We estimate the total economic impact of this $6.5 million project to reach $11.4 million. 70 jobs will be directly affected. Indirectly, we estimate the impact on employment in our region at 337 FTEs. Why ensure and expand access to Clayton at our nation's 250th anniversary? It is the only site, the only site in southwestern Pennsylvania that allows people to step back in time and immerse ourselves in a fully authentic, accessible space from the crucial moment in American history when steel made Pittsburgh a global superpower. At that time, Clayton was the home of one of the most powerful men in the world, uh, Bill Gates or Elon Musk of the late 1800s. Clayton was the home of Frick, the steel industrialist, financier, and internationally celebrated art collector. Visitors who take the new Clayton tour, unveiled this month after a two-year project developed with a diverse dream team of regional and national advisors explore the fateful year of 1892 and consider the impact of decisions made by Frick and his associates 
on our lives as Americans today. For example, participants consider the modern conception of time as something structured more by a factory punch clock than the agrarian cycle of the seasons. They consider the development of vertically integrated companies that own each stage of production. This was one of Frick's many inventions that he introduced to modern business practices. They think about modern worker protections, including those that ultimately resulted from the months-long violent homestead strike of 1892, overseen by Frick as the manager in charge, in which 10 people died. They consider the origins of Pittsburgh's distinct ethnic neighborhoods in international immigration and the great migration of African Americans from the South as people sought better jobs in industrial manufacturing. They consider factors impacting maternal and infant health outcomes and other changes to people's relationship to nature, including industrial pollution, the environmental movement, and even the widespread availability of canned foods. Who knew but canned fruit salad was the most elite dessert available in 1892? Events that took place at Clayton shaped the nation and impacted the world. They included decisions made around the breakfast table where Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Mellon, and George Westinghouse gathered with Frick for a weekly poker game, thereby squeezing 60% of America's industrial wealth into one beautifully decorated 400 square foot room and around the dining table where President Theodore Roosevelt came for a grand luncheon during his 4th of July 1902 visit to Pittsburgh to acknowledge the oligarchs who had so generously supported his campaign. Today, the poignant location of Clayton on Penn Avenue, once Pittsburgh's Millionaire's Row and now the intersection of Point Breeze and Homewood two very different neighborhoods in terms of wealth and opportunities, lends urgency to the Frick's redoubled focus on serving as a welcoming community resource for all, including our black and brown neighbors who haven't historically thought of the museum as a place for them. George Santayana famously said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The history we discover at Clayton continues to impact us all and points the way forward to a brighter, more equitable future for every Pennsylvanian. With America 250 Pennsylvania support, we will protect and enhance this unique time machine, providing millions of visitors with the insights we need now more than ever, as together we write the next chapter in our Commonwealth's and our nation's great history. Thank you. Well done, thank you. Can you explain the million dollars? What exactly would that go to? It would, um, we would be very open to applying it to whichever part of the project appealed to you most. Like many old house projects, this one is complicated. First, we'll remove 18 layers of paint, which were applied by the Frick family over more than 100 years, revealing the original brick. We'll restore the masonry as we need to, because right now the paint is peeling from the surface water is getting in and it's damaging the historic interiors. Mm. Then we will apply a super architectural paint that lasts for 45 years. It's called chyme mineral silicate. It bonds with the substructure of the brick and creates an air permeable water vapor barrier. Then we want to light the building so that it feels inviting. Henry Clay Frick built what looked like a castle to impress his neighbors, and we want people to think of it as every bit as welcoming as the Disney castle. And we'll do some landscaping because right now we're so popular with families with little kids, we want to create a toddler protection barrier that looks beautiful, attracts pollinators, and sends a signal to our neighbors as they pass that we are a place where they would be welcome. So you can tour the, the building right now? Yes. It's just, that w is, is any part of the building due to the, the state of disrepair um, a part of the building that you cannot actually go? More than half of the building is unavailable to visitors, in part because of fire code reasons, but largely because of condition. We have the technology to share it if it were in presentable condition. And one of the main rooms, the rooms where Teddy Roosevelt took a famous nap, cannot be shared <laughs> because 
water came in and the wallpapers peeling down everything in the room was damaged it's not in a shape that we can so with the million dollars by 2026 if 50 percent is not uh, accessible to the public how much then would become accessible so that you could open the doors what are we looking at we would be able to make the upper floors available using technology so people could tour it without climbing up the single staircase because you need two points of egress for fire reasons. We could address the blue bedroom and we are pretty sure we could take care of the outside of the house, but I say that touch wood because it is an old house and we're prepared that there might be something we didn't expect as we start to peel away the levels. So we think we would be at what our architects tell us is the phrase substantial completion. Okay. Uh, questions, comments? I'm good. I'm good. Jenna, you're good? good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fred, I, j I had something for you. Um, I, f I was thinking about it. Um, in Butler County, right, because I'm thinking of 2026 in terms of history, how pivotal is, the, pivotal is this landmark? Well, it's very significant. We have met with the Butler County Commissioners recently, and they do feel that this is very significant because of John Roebling's legacy, and it is the birthplace. Uh, the Butler County, I'm sure you've heard about the Jeep, and there are other parts of Butler County that we have started a lot there o over the years. But this is uh, the, the Pullman Railroad and all that. But this is uh, a significant part because it, it's the immigration, marks the immigration of John Roebling, mm -hmm. but it also is a structure that can help teach people about immigration, about wire rope cabling, and then suspension bridges, which were, uh, with the ultimate being the Brooklyn Bridge. The commissioners are prioritizing this? Yes, we met with them and they have, uh, we actually, they set up a meeting with the uh, several department heads and we recently met with the department heads and the commissioners uh, and uh, they have been looking into how they could help us with this work project as well. Our goal is that we, if we can get the money by next year, hopefully the work could be completed in 2024 uh, and certainly we could get it up and running. We plan to add on to this to make it educational as well. We want to have an area where people can see how wire rope was twisted. It was all manually twisted. Eight to 16 men would twist the cable. Uh, there was no factory on those grounds there. Uh, and so we were also thinking about how we could, uh, we've all been looking into how could we set up something for children to learn That's how a to good twist idea. the cabling. Uh, matter of fact, a, a young lady came up with an idea that you know how they twist brace the little girl's bra twist uh -huh. bracelet? It's really the concept, the mm -hmm. same as twisting the wire rope cabling. So we could set up some of these sort of exercises and programs, uh, but right now the building is not, uh, we, we can't, uh, the, there's a weight limit in, in, uh, in the building, we can't do anything inside of it. Thank you, Cassandra. That was just, I was gonna ask that. So the site as it is right now, how many visitors do you get per year? Well, uh, Post-COVID, <laughs> obviously, we had to take some time getting built up, but we, last year we had about 500 people come to the site for the museum and the, the wire rope workshop, which we thought was pretty good last year. And uh, do you keep track of where they come from? Yes, we do. We have, uh, if, I, if I have more time, but, uh, our register has uh, people from Washington State, we have people from Arizona, we have people from Tennessee, uh, we do have a lot of people come from New Jersey and New York. Uh, and uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, because of the Roebling Bridge that's in there, uh, Cincinnati and Covington uh, across the river there in the Ohio, uh, they come from there too. So we're very, very uh, proud of having people come from all over the United States. Yep. So, so yeah. how, how, does, how do you promote yourself? And it's the same thing with Brick. It, it, how do you do it on your own or do you use, use someone to, to promote so these folks can come from other places to well, know about we do, you? We do social media. We have. Uh, we have, uh, we have social media that uh, uh, is getting more and more attention. Uh, we're very, very grateful that uh, there's a number of German societies because of uh, Roebling coming from Mulhausen, uh, Prussia, we're now Germany. Uh, they help promote this. We've been uh, with our fund drive that started on, on April 1st. Uh, we've had a number of those organizations been sharing the word and we've been getting uh, donations uh, from around the country uh, to say, hey, we don't want this, we don't want yeah. to lose this. This is significant to our history as well as the American history. And yeah. does Butler County Tourism promotes? Yes, they, promo yeah. they promote they the, do a good job promoting. The they do a good job promoting Butler County. 
um, in general. Yes. Yes, they do. And we're very grateful. We are, uh, the borough of Saxonburg is a member of the Butler Tourism, and uh, they have uh, done videos in the uh, Saxonburg Museum, our Roebling Room in particular, and so they help promote it as well. Uh, and that, that helps because they get some national attention as well. Uh, but it's, some of it's just word of mouth. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, if we, uh, uh, we had a man uh, come from uh, Brooklyn, uh, and uh, he, uh, he came specifically, and then he went back to Brooklyn to talk about it, and uh, uh, he wanted to see the Roebling, uh, Pente uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, we had uh, some people come uh, last year, uh, and uh, they had worked for U.S. Steel in Bethlehem, and so they wanted to see where did John Roebling start this, and they wanted to see and experience that. Yes, uh, the Frick uh, has a marketing team of two exceptionally hardworking people. Uh, we bring in about 114,000 visitors in a given year, and we know we have 300,000 discrete visitors to our website, but attendance is growing now that we've all come back to life after the challenging past few years. As Fred was saying, we find that our community partners are often the best way to build deep relationships. And while we're very happy to have tourists, it means a great deal to us when some of the educational and social service groups that we work with on a weekly, daily, monthly basis feel that the Frick is a place for them and come back with their families. Those are the relationships that we learn from. We can't imagine what our visitors need unless they tell us. And the better we know them, the better we can serve them. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Next up, Tyler from the Allegheny County Airport Authority. Please come up. I won't be talking through the slides, but I figured you'd have something nice to look at while I was talking. Uh, but my name is Tyler Lockman. I'm Director of Corporate and Government Relations at the Allegheny County Airport Authority, and I appreciate the time to be here today to share uh, a project that we think is very exciting. Uh, as we look at the 250th birthday of America, one can marvel at the accomplishments behind us, those that were never thought possible by generations before us, uh, for the leaps in technology and medical breakthroughs, progress and innovation moves quickly here, defying what we ever thought possible. As President Ronald Reagan once said, America's best days are yet to come. And we applaud the work of this committee to honor both the path behind us and the path uh, in front of us in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. At Pittsburgh International Airport, we believe that our story represents the unconquerable spirit of America and that our campus embraces the natural beauty of Western Pennsylvania, offering a unique historical education for our passengers and guests. It is a place that will inspire and captivate every traveler, welcoming them wholeheartedly and leaving them with a profound appreciation for the region's exceptional features and splendor. The foundational design principles of the Pittsburgh International Airport's Terminal Modernization Program are rooted in nature, technology, and community, or NATECO. These principles are seamlessly integrated throughout every aspect of the program's design, ensuring an immersive and awe-inspiring experience for all who pass through these gates. As is often said, just as Pittsburgh was once considered the gateway to the West, Pittsburgh International Airport is considered the gateway to the region, welcoming both visitors and returning residents well before they have their Fort Pitt Tunnel experience. All ends of the aviation sector, including the terminal project, felt the impact of the pandemic. It caused personal hardship and economic tur turmoil, halting numerous developments across our great country, but nevertheless, the Pittsburgh Airport team was resilient and throughout this trying period we dedicated ourselves to staying on the course through these challenging times and develop an implementable uh, pandemic strategies to aid the airport's recovery. Some of these strategies were born directly in response to the pandemic while others were already evident in the design philosophy. One prime example of the evident design strategy was the development of four outdoor landscape terraces which you have images of in front of you. These terraces not only encapsulate the essence of the region's forested Appalachians, rolling hills, narrow valleys, and steep ridges, 
but also serve as havens of tranquility, providing social distancing measures and promoting health and wellness. These terraces become natural focal points, offering respite for the often frenetic pace of an international airport, all while showcasing the profound history and beauty of Western Pennsylvania. They serve as reminders of our rich heritage, where the people's grit and determination harmonize with the land's rugged beauty. Just as pioneers and industrialists before us, we continue to embrace the land's bounty and cherish the national, natural wonders. The incorporation of these natural elements in this thoroughly modern facility evoke the spirit of falling water, Frank Lloyd Wright's organic architectural masterpiece, which calls the region home. It demonstrates the artistry, culture, and innovative design that is hallmarked to this region. The landscape terraces embody this spirit, bridging the past and present, and inviting us all to appreciate the unique features and beauty that have shaped Pittsburgh's remarkable journey. These terraces also bring a sense of community to the heart of the airport, serving as a gathering place for cultural, social, celebratory events. From employee and public events, open house, uh, public announcements, musical events, and educational forums, they will be a prominent platform from which we will proudly promote the area's diverse and rich culture and community. The new Pittsburgh International Airport with its magnificent landscape terraces embodies the Niteco principles and truly reflects the spirit of Pennsylvania and our great nation. By partnering with America 250 PA, we can utilize the natural beauty of Western Pennsylvania to welcome, inspire, and captivate all who visit this region. And we thank you for your consideration of our project and hope that you will evaluate how we could partner with you to spread the message of America 250 PA. Thanks, Tyler. So the, the mo how much are you requesting? Uh, 2.5 million. And so it would go to sort of these, this outdoor space. Correct. And what is, what is the average amount of time a passenger waits in the Pittsburgh airport? Uh, that really depends on how early they want to get there. Representative. Uh, I, I can try and find a, an average time for you. I don't think I have that off the top of but this would be, I'm just thinking like the outdoor space people would use, so you would have the option, you could sit in the terminal, of course, you could do that anytime. Yeah. But the idea is you want to divert people to go outside to experience sort of the natural beauty of Western Pennsylvania. Yeah. That's the idea. The unique aspect of this is uh, very few if any US airports have uh, outdoor spaces that you can access once you're in the terminal, uh, and especially once you're post security beyond maybe an airline club that you have to be a member of or pay a fee for. Exactly. This would be open to all traveling passengers, but also those meters and greeters. Uh, Pittsburgh is a unique, I think, in the fact that people will drive out to the airport to pick up their loved ones or drop them off, um, more so than some other uh, major airports. So will you have any food out here? Yes, so we have uh, the ability to program for food, we have the availability to program for entertainment, uh, for educational spaces, certainly art is all considered. Events? And is this be project begun? Yes, we broke ground on it a couple years ago. The, the terminal project itself will complete, it'll be complete at the end of 2024, and we hope to open it in early 2025. So what is the 2.5? The 2.5 goes towards the, the piece that is specific to the four terraces. I, they're not complete. It, it's in the process right now, so we're, we're putting up structural steel presently. So they're not complete, yes. This is building a, a brand new terminal. Th these images. Correct. Got it. Got it. Got it. You have yeah. Representative Cole. So this is this is before security or after security? So the plan right now is to have two larger terraces pre-security. Okay. And then two smaller terraces post-security. Okay. And they would the the post-security ones would be closer to terminal, like the gates, so somebody could Correct. actually wait. Correct. And Instead not miss the Instead of sitting at the gate in an uncomfortable yeah. chair potentially, or walking around the terminal, you could come outside. Get okay. a breath of fresh air, enjoy some of the that will be there. Okay. Cassandra. And Tyler, what happens in the winter? Uh, we have program for heated sidewalks, and uh, I left out an image from the winter time, but we have plans for the winter experience as well. Good question. Thank you. Dory, Senator, you have anything? Good, thank you. Just, um, no, thank you. And, um, uh, Something we, we, yeah, we don't, I mean, I'm just thinking about Philadelphia. We certainly don't have this, any kind of use of outdoor space. Yeah, it is very unique to any airport we've experienced or studied. Mm -hmm. 
You said if you're lucky, you're maybe getting a balcony outside of a, an airline club. What, what, like in this image, yeah. what is here currently at the airport? Nothing. So this is all part of our-, our Just like blacktop, concrete. Yeah, our, right now our airport is designed with separated land side and air side terminals. So this is a project to combine those two buildings. So all of this would be, would be new. These kids are not out there right <laughs> now. Not presently. No. Not presently, yet. Yes. Tyler, thank you so Absolutely. much. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Donald, Beaver County Industrial Museum. Donald, please come up. Before I start, everybody was introducing themselves. Uh, maybe you understand why I'm so much interested in history. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my family came to Beaver County in 1794, settled in uh, Darrington area, then moved to Chippewa. Uh, my, I belong to the Sons of Union Veterans of Civil War, I have two Civil War soldiers, and I belong to the um, the Philadelphia chapter of the Sons or the, of the Society of the War of 1812, and I have seven revolutionary ancestors. Uh, two of the, the more notable, one was um, Charles Lukens, who, uh, who is interesting. He was the um, in charge of the artillery in the Continental Line and was a Quaker, if you understand what I just said. And uh, I don't know how he didn't get thrown out of the Philadelphia meeting, but anyway, and the other one would be John Dunlap, and he was a printer of the Declaration of Independence. So you can see why I have an interest in history. And when, whenever I uh, decided that and saw the mills were going down, and I'll get into that, let me read this one. Uh, and as I said, my name is Donald Inman. I was a member of Local 1211, United Steelworkers of America, for 41 years, working at the Jones and Lockham Steel Company in Aliquippa. Is there anybody on the board that had any relatives that worked at Jones and Lockham? Nope, okay. Uh, I started collecting items from Jan L. Steele in 1980 before the mill started going down. I had a large collection of items, I mean a, a large collection of items, did a display at Geneva College back in 1980 and started the Beaver County Museum at the college. We were there for some years and then the college wanted the building so we moved out and took the museum to Historic Darrington, PA. And the reason we did that is one of the Little Beaver Historical Society uh, directors uh, saw this house being foreclosed on next door and thought it'd be nice if we could come out there and add to their, you know, to their museums as well. So we did do that. Uh, and as I said, there are five other uh, museum buildings and uh, we moved everything into the house. We're incorporated in Pennsylvania and have a 501c3 from the IRS. History of glass, steel, and atomic power industries in Beaver County is a catalyst and the focus of our museum. We have an extensive collection of documents, photographs, slides, movies, videos, artifacts from various periods in the past 165 years. 
uh, on display in our four rooms with a two-room library. The library has been used by many scholars obtaining advanced degrees using the available materials. A large number of books have been spurred from the collection. This is one that Dr. Woman and I did while we were at the college, so you can see the quality of the books. Um, uh, we have uh, we have enlarged the, co the collection, expanded into other industrial companies that operate in Bureau County in the 19th and the 20th century. Uh, we are open on Sunday afternoons from 1 to 4:30, May through August, and are located at 801 Plum Street in Darlington. Our phone number is 724-3120831, and to make an appointment at any other times, and we open when possible for anyone who's interested, and we do that almost. Well, at least once a week, if not, if not, sometimes. We've had people come make appointments from Germany. We've had people come from Boston. We've had people come from all over the country. Um, having said all that, we're working on a project to list every steel worker who ever worked in the mill in Beaver County in the 20th century. We have completed Moultrup Steel Products, listing every worker, ANS Railroad, which was in Jan L, listing every worker, Crucible Steel in Midland, and we are now working on Jan L out of Quippa have completed 45,000 names, and they're all in Excel spreadsheets. And we have uh, date hired, check number, employment number, department they worked in, date retired, and if we know the date they, die, uh, they uh, died. Um, it's being done for the future people to know who worked in the mills and companies in Beaver County. Uh, and one of the greatest, largest in the nation in World War II effort was 17 companies getting the Army Navy E Award for excellence, and if you don't know anything about that, I can tell you about it. Beaver County had one of the largest industrial bases in the United States. Most people don't realize that. I think we had, I'm told we had more people get the E Award, which is the Award of Excellence from the federal government, than any other county in the country. At least that's my understanding. We were grown out of our house museum. As our storage buildings are full, we have property to build on next to the museum. We hope to build a block building 110 feet long and 60 feet wide. So we have a proposal from Draw Collective uh, for our first part of a grant of $18,565 to do the design, and then our second part of the grant to do the building. They tell us that we need a million dollars. So the total would be $1,018,565 to preserve the industrial history of Pennsylvania and Beaver County in the 19th and 20th centuries. And if you're wondering, the oldest piece that we have in the museum is um, uh, of well, an iron pig, uh, and it's from uh, uh, um, 1814. Now, I, ha I wear hearing aids, and I'm hearing most of you well, but if you will, speak up. <laughs> Thank you for the testimony. Do you have a rendering of what this would look like? Um, I don't have an actual rendering of it, no, but I, they should have given you the architect's information. That was with the... Uh, uh, the they should have given you a copy of the letter, and then with it was the architect's um, draw collective, um, which is everything of what it would look like. Basically, it's, it's a building that would be like this, 60 feet wide, 110 feet long, uh, metal roof, cement block. And um, what we would do then is it would be an open, big open room. And the idea of that is that we have things all around the county. We even have um, uh, what they call the speed pulpit out of the strip mill which is a pulpit probably oh, from her over to the wall, and, well, and uh, about uh, 10 feet high and about eight feet deep. We have the, the operators operated in and stuff like that. We have stuff that we don't even have on the property that we'd like to try and get in. Um, we have this extensive library, and what's really nice about the library is uh, the number of people that have used it. We've had uh, one young man get his bachelor's, we've had four get their master's, we just had one fellow get his master's degree uh, on using the stuff on the uh, atomic energy. Um, we've had three get their doctorates, and uh, after we're done, if you want to hear a story on that, I got a good one from one lady got her doctor from Carnegie Mellon. Carol and I went to her dissertation, and I don't know if you've ever been to one of those or not, but it was interesting, <laughs> and we made a significant difference. Um, but um, uh, I do not have a drawing, but anyway, what it would look like would be the big room you walk in the main door, there'd be two restrooms on the, the left. Opposite that would be a, a, a meeting room, uh, about uh, 20 by 30, uh, 20 feet deep, 30 feet wide. 
And then from that meeting room would go back, would be uh, a room about 12 feet wide that would have stacks in them, and th that would be where the, the library would be kept. And then we would have everybody who wanted to work with it would work in the meeting room, and that kind of thing. And you, you, want, you say it takes a, a little over a million dollars? Right. And you'll be able to build, build out this whole structure for that? That's, I've had one contractor, two architects tell me, that that's why I was sort of put on the floor. Uh, uh, Seems you, low. If you think of a large concrete block garage, which right. is not what this is, and, they, and they're saying by the time we put the wall in, get the library in, it's going to be a million dollars. And so I said, mentioned, I showed, I had a floor drawing, and I'm sure I didn't bring one with me. Uh, floor drawing, I showed the contractor, he said he can do it for a million dollars. Uh, I went to a, an architect, and the architect, uh, I didn't care much for, but he looked at it. Uh, he wanted $90,000 to do the architectural renderings, and he said it would be a million dollars. So then we had the fellow from Draw Collector, which is from Mount Lebanon, down, and he went through everything, and he said that, uh, that he would do it for the 18, and that, which I thought, after having the 90, I thought was reasonable. And he, said, he thought that take a million dollars to do it as well. So, you know, who am I? <laughs> but but the, the floor plan is very simple, if you understand what I'm saying. And, when, and the reason we want to keep it open is then what that does is that gives us the opportunity then to put in portable walls. And as an example, one of the things we have now is we have one room we have for atomic energy. Well, shipping port power, to, shipping port atomic power plant was the first atomic power plant in the world. And, you know, and that was Eisenhower's uh, baby. He went all over the country and tried to get someone to sponsor <coughs> the electrical side, and, and, and the government was going to sponsor the, uh, uh, the atomic power side. And um, no one would do it. Finally, the president, who came right, said he would do it. And he did, the shipping port. And um, so that, and then they shut it down and made it into a breeder reactor. We have photographs of Jimmy Carter and uh, Admiral Rick over at Senator Stennis uh, when they uh, actually turned the power on. We have the unit that they used to turn the power on there from the Oval Office. So, uh, and, and people, the problem with this, people send us stuff all the time. Uh, as an example, uh, people read it, we're on the internet, and people read about us on the internet, and when they shut the power, atomic power plant down, the gentleman that was in charge of shutting it down had 17 volumes of books that they used to shut it down. And one day I got an email from him and he wanted to know if I was interested in it. I said, absolutely. He sent him, cost him $70 and had these books. And this the last gentleman that uh, got his master's degree used some of that material because nobody's ever seen it. You know, and used some of that material, you know, to... Uh, and then another thing we had was we had them um, a fellow uh, called from Washington State and made an appointment. And it did, never ceases uh, you know, to amaze me because we have the JNL book collection from Mount Equipa. We have the B&W book collection from B&W in Beaver Falls. And uh, then we have uh, uh, the 1212 Union Hall, all of their uh, collection of books. But anyway, this fellow came from Washington State and he was a postdoc in uh, history. Uh, and, uh, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, in um, safety. Well, I didn't even know you could get a doctor in safety. But anyway, he had a postdoc in safety, and he wanted to, to see our records. And so he, I told him what I you know, had and whatnot. And I said, Do you want to see any of the accidents? And he said, That's impossible. I said, What do you mean it's impossible? He said, Every, every company always destroyed all their accident reports. He said, mm -hmm. I said, Oh, no, I'd have five books of the accident reports. And so he looked at him. He had a camera. And he sat there for the rest of the day copying each page in all five books. When he was done, he told me that was the holy grail of safety. Could be, I don't know. But that's the kind of records that we have, you know. And you, can you imagine that this, that we've been working on this, and we're trying to get other records that we can. Uh, I've got a fellow now working on Duquesne Light, trying to get us all the records from the folks that started out at shipping port, because it's a big hit. Does anyone else have any questions? And Rep Gatus, I'm sorry. I, if you have any questions for Fred or Liz or Don, Tyler, please feel free. 
Yeah, if, if I want to make sure that you're, you're included in the back and forth. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Don, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, we have to do something, you know, if it isn't, you know, and it's certainly appropriate because uh, it's uh, very historical for the mm -hmm. And the biggest thing is what we really want to do tours and with all the different museums, you know, and why the restaurants have never done anything. But, you know, what happens is because we have this house, if we get a bus tour, they'll come and they'll see the house. They figure that's the office, and they go visit the other museums. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Tony and Brenda from the Beaver County Historical Research and Landmarks. County Historical Research and Landmarks. Good. Oh, please, oh, Tony, yeah. go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Tony Kaiser, and this is Brenda Applegate. We're here representing the Beaver County History and Landmarks, um, the Research and Landmarks Foundation, specifically about the Logstown and Legionville Preservation Project. Um, we endeavor to have a site, uh, to save a site of great importance that may soon be permanently lost to industrialization. When we use the word site here, we're actually talking about a place that shared two important historical events over a span of decades. First, it was Logstown, um, then Legionville. This site is located in Harmony Township between Ambridge and Baden along the Ohio River. It's literally impossible to overstate the importance of this site in the story of America. At this spot, the French laid claim to the Ohio country. George Washington prepared his visit uh, uh, to the French at Fort LaBeouf and the fire was lit that started the French and Indian War. Matt, General Matt Anthony Wayne prepared the first modern army at America's first training center there. And um, it, it, it touches on so many different points, it's impossible to overstate that. Originally, that site was a Native American village. In the 1700s, in the post-contact period, um, it was used by Shawnee, Wyandotte, and Delaware tribes primarily as a trading post and a meeting place. Everyone thinks that Pittsburgh was the place, but uh, parenthetically, it was prone to seasonal flooding, uh, so there weren't permanent native habitations typically around the point. They chose this place because it was easily accessible downriver. It's a high dry plateau with, a lovely, at that time, a lovely stream going through it, so they had access to the river and access to fresh water. And according to archaeological studies that were completed in the 40s, it was used continuously back to the time of the mound builders. Um, the um, Treaty of Logstown was signed on this site in 1792. Uh, the, as a prelude to the French and Indian War, George Washington spent a week at Logstown meeting with the half king, Tanner Charison. After the disaster of St. Clair's defeat in 19, 18, 1791, George Washington brought Revolutionary War General Matt Anthony Wayne out of retirement to take command of the new American Legion. That was General Wayne's term. General Wayne renamed Logstown Legionville, and it became, in the words of the U.S. Army Archives, the Army's first training center. Throughout the winter of 1792 and 1793, troops were drilled in military skills and tactics. The following spring, the newly named Legion of the United States left Legionville for the Northwest Indian War. The overwhelming success, overwhelmingly successful campaign was concluded with a decisive victory at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in August of 1794, and the training that the troops received at Legionville was seen as instrumental to that victory. 17 American soldiers are buried at Legionville. Their graves remain un unmarked, but they should be remembered by a grateful nation. Senator John Hines attempted to make this site a national park, but the bill was pocket vetoed due to a clerical error by someone in the uh, Jimmy Carter administration. And over the last 10 years, parts of this site have been lost, first to an automobile dealership and then to a recycling plant. This may be our last chance to save any part of this site. This site is every bit as important as Fort Pitt, Fort Ligonier, Fort Necessity, and the Bushy Run battle site, all of which had been saved and reconstructed. 
it's our hope that this can be saved in order to create new paths of knowledge and understanding uh, to preserve our history. So we appreciate your consideration. Now what you're looking at is this, on this that was given to you, is the Ohio River is to the north. Um, this is Wright GMC. This is the recycling plant. There's a, mar a marker here on a small patch of grass to commemorate this site. Um, and the rest has been used primarily as a slag dump over the, over the past years. Um, and so there's plenty of ground there to preserve and we have a number of sketches from early journals and military journals to be able to restore this to something where it could be appreciated as a walking tour. And Brenda, do you have additional? Well, I'd also like to add that this site was, they tried to save this site um, pre-World War I, mm -hmm. and the, the project was not completed because of World War I. So we have had people supporting this project since the early 1900s, mm -hmm. um, and just because of some clerical errors, um, it hasn't come to fruition. Can you explain, you said there's, you have historical records where you can mark a trail? Not just that, but the site, the um, general bouquet, the outlet, the layout of this camp, like where the marker is, which is along Cuss Avenue in this photograph. Right. Uh, that was the parade ground on the front. We have everything down to officers' quarters, uh, uh, dining facilities, and everything sketched out there. Okay, I see. There's some uh, early sketchings. There's a very famous photograph of George Washington there when it was a Native American village. So our hopes are to combine both sites, Legion Hill and Longstown, and represent it. Um, we are part of the Lewis and Clark Trail, which mm -hmm. uh, Clark served at Legion Hill. So that is, um, now that it's been a nationally recognized trail starting in Pittsburgh, this is one place to showcase that. Uh, we are also part of the George Washington 1753 Trail. We don't have a home to showcase all of this information. And that's what we're looking for So there, the money had, there was some sort of earmark. You said there was a clerical error when Senator Hines had secured, so he had secured the funding. And, and actually Senator Hines had, and then he died prematurely, mm -hmm. and Jimmy Carter left office after one term, and he fell off. And there have been a number of attempts at it over and over, but nothing really has come together. So there's sort of agreement that this is an important historical yeah. site, and has been, you said since World War one this this effort started? Yes. The DAR and the veterans um, at that time were fighting to recognize the site as a national landmark. Okay. Now are you you're both Beaver County, right? Yes, Do you all work together? Um, yes, actually Beaver County Historical Research and Landmarks is recognized as the official county historical society and we have formed a coalition of twenty one historical sites in our county that all work together. We, we meet probably three to four times a year. Don's Industrial Museum is part of that group. Um, we actually had a meeting yesterday to plan for a um, history weekend, the first weekend in May. Oh, that's good. So, and if you as sort of a collective prioritize projects within Beaver County? We are all pretty much independent. Okay. We work Volunteers, they can reach out to the coalition and say, please come to help us. But each of the 21 sites have their own board, have their own members, and develop their own programs to see whether it events or education. But bringing them together, I think, understanding just your question, isn't, is totally conceivable. A wonderful example, because we're going to have a commemoration this year for the Bridge of Watts Mill. Um, it's a tremendously important site. It's the site of a former Indian captive and the first first settler out there. Um, and one of the earliest grist mills and the last pony trust bridge in the United States. I mean, just touch point after touch point, it was slated for demolition by PennDOT back in 2013. And everybody got together, History and Landmarks, Little Beaver Historical Society, um, the local townships, uh, North Country Trail Association, and we were able to bring that together successfully to save that, save that bridge in, in a very beautiful 
this this is the kind of project that brings everything together. Um, the Beaver County Commissioners uh, are behind this, so we have lots of support. Yeah, that's always helpful whenever we see kind of the different government, business, the civic fabric kind of coming together and saying this is the project or these these are the group of projects that we would like to see done. We Did you have something? Oh. By the Yeah. Um, our organization um, organized a, a whole year celebration um, in 2000 for the Beaver County's birthday. Um, I wasn't there in 1976, but they coordinated that history event as well. So. You have something? No, it's a great Senator? project. What was the, what's the total uh, cost? 2.5. 2.5. Thank you. Mostly land acquisition. And that position, we also, before anything goes up, we want to do an archaeological survey um, at that beginning process of um, establishing that. Just, sorry, just one more. The, I'm just very interested in the coordination because it's, uh, it's not typical that all these kind of entities are working together. It's very unusual. So are you sort of at the front, like are you, your group, does everyone sort of fall under you and you call these meetings together and then there's collaboration that way? The coalition does. Um, as I said, we are all independent, but in 2000, um, we formed a task force and the, all of the organizations were having events in their own communities. But since 2000, we have remained a coalition and still meet and share educational programs, speakers, working together, like you said, it is unusual. Very, yeah. It's like herding, yeah. herding cats. <laughs> exactly. It was like trying to get a high school reunion together after 30 years and you get everybody involved in and in place on multiple organizations. Yeah. Um, I think that would be our model for the development of this post-land acquisition. It's great work. Tony, Brenda, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to everybody. Um, we're going to continue. So we have two tours. We've broken up the Commonwealth into six regions. So we're going to be back in this region again. And then once we wrap up, we'll take a look at all the projects. The idea is then to select projects, put them in a very large appropriation request, and hopefully be able to announce good news uh, prior to 2026. Uh, concluding remarks, Rep. Gatos. Yeah, well, welcome to Alameda County. Thanks for having us. And again, welcome to Carnegie. Happy to have everybody here in my district. Thank you for having me. I appreciated the opportunity. I just want to thank everybody again for the wonderful testimony for the projects and I just want to remind everybody that our next hearing is July 13th at 1 p.m. in Pike County. Representative Sullivan. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you all.